Please uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 11. We are halfway through the book of Revelation. This is a pivotal chapter. Uh, and I hope that uh, you can track with me as I walk us through it and uh, draw some application. When we look at the state of the evangelical church in many parts of the world today, it seems that the gates of hell are prevailing against it. Persecution is on the rise in places like India, Africa, China, Middle East, as well as here in the West as we see an anti-God, anti-Christ sentiment prevailing in many sectors of our society. And from within the church itself, we see many false teachers who are promoting false gospels. The tendency for us is to get discouraged and to feel defeated and to give up on our mission of reaching the lost for Christ. This chapter 11 uh, of Revelation helps us to get an eternal perspective on our life and mission as a church. It shows us that things will get worse before they get better, that our victory is certain because our king reigns in heaven, and one day the kingdom of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. But until then, as Paul says to the believers, that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of heaven or God. Now, since it's been a while since we've been in the book, uh, let me just catch us up on uh, as to where we are now. At the end of chapter 8, John pronounces three woes that will follow with the sounding of the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet. Uh, in chapter 9, the two woes were accomplished with the blowing of the fifth and sixth trumpet. And uh, we would have expected that chapter 10 would go right into the seventh trumpet, as he did between, but John, under the uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he interrupts the uh, judgment narrative, as he did between the second, sixth and seventh uh, seal, to answer these two questions that are on the hearts and minds of suffering saints throughout the centuries. The questions are these. How long? How long will this suffering continue? When is Jesus coming back to judge evil and establish his righteous kingdom? The second question is this. What will happen to believers during the time of the tribulation? In chapter 10, he answered the first question of how long by saying there will be no more delay. Once that seventh trumpet is sounded, there will be no more delay. In other words, sin and, and evil will not continue on forever and ever. There is an end, and God has established a day in history in which he will accomplish his righteous, bring about his righteous kingdom. That is good news indeed. And in chapter 11, he will answer the question of what happens to the saints uh, during this time of difficult time of tribulation. Well, there's been, as you know, tribulation throughout from the very beginning of time, from the very beginning of the inception of the church of Christ, there's been tribulation. Even John, as he's writing, he says, I am writing to you as your fellow in the tribulation. He is in 2,000 years ago. He's writing as one who is in the midst of tribulation as he's writing as an exile from the island of Patmos for his faith. So chapter 11 follows immediately after John eats the scroll. If you remember, he was given this scroll. The angel, this mighty angel, was holding the scroll in his hand 
John was told to go to the angel. He takes, he takes the scroll from the, from the hand of the angel. He eats it, and it is sweet to his mouth, but bitter to his stomach. Sweet to his mouth. The good news that evil will not continue indefinitely is sweet and good news. But there is going to be a bitter part to this. As we will see in chapter 11, believers will be persecuted and put to death. That's the bitter part. But it doesn't stop there, as we will see by God's grace. We will learn today about the fate of believers in a time of tribulation. This will be the bitter part of the scroll as believers will face suffering and death. Now, uh, before we get into the exposition of the chapter, let me just say something about the method of interpretation. Now, I could have said this in the very beginning of our exposition back in day one when we started this, but as, as I, I read and as I, over time, uh, things begin to gel even more. So let me give you a little bit about methods of interpretation. This will just take a moment. So it may seem a little bit uh, academic. Just bear with me for a moment. As he has done all along, John makes allusion to the Old Testament. In fact, the book of Revelation makes the most allusions to the Old Testament as any other book in the New Testament. It, it do, he doesn't quote verbatim as some of the other uh, uh, gospels or epistles do. He just makes allusions as we will see in our chapter. He does the same thing here like measuring the temple, the two witnesses who are martyred, and from the description we see that they are Elijah and Moses. Their bodies are left in, this, uh, in the street of the great, great city called Sodom and Egypt, uh, where Christ was crucified and so on. Now, Methods of interpretation is that um, there's a, what's called a futurist way of seeing everything uh, basically from chapter 4 on all the way to the new heavens and the new earth in, in, uh, in Revelation 21. That's called the futurist view. Uh, who, they would take a more literal approach in their interpretation of the book. Uh, and they see this chapter as predominantly applying to Israel and the Jewish people in the final seven years of tribulation in regards to their judgment, per, uh, preservation, and conversion. And I'll try to point that out as I go along. Now, my, uh, uh, my take on why John uses, makes these allusions, allusions to the Old Testament are these. One is that to show that the redemptive plan of God is one uh, and the same for both Old and New Testament believers. Two, it's to give us a historical background to help us understand these, uh, these uh, apocalyptic visions better. For example, when he makes a reference to Balaam, or Jezebel, or Sodom, or the sealing of the believers, or the lion from the tribe of Judah. Now, if you know your Old Testament, when you hear Sodom, immediately that registers something in your mind. Sodom was a place of wickedness, perversion sexual immorality, right? So all he has to do is just say Sodom, and immediately those who are familiar with their Old Testament scripture would understand and know what he's talking about. He used the word Balaam. Well, you remember how Balaam tricked the people of Israel to commit sexual immorality with the Moabite woman. So, it, so he uses these in order to kind of give us a placeholder in our mind, put things in perspective when he says they were in the city called Sodom. Well, it wasn't Sodom, but you understand what he means. Uh, or Egypt, and so on. Uh, so these are, uh, so I believe that a figurative interpretation is more in keeping with John's intent for writing the book, and that is the interpretive approach I will be taking. And as I have stated in the past, my aim is to focus on what I believe to be one of John's main purpose for writing the book, namely, to encourage suffering saints throughout the centuries to look to Christ, our risen and glorious King, and to persevere under trial, knowing that Christ is returning and we have a glorious future ahead of us. That is our, my aim, my, my main concern, brethren. I, you can hold any position, 
There's all kinds of positions, and that is fine with me. But let us walk away with the application that is intended by this book. Whatever that other, we can lose the forest from the trees. And I don't want to do that. So stick with me, and let's draw the application that John wants us to get. Because remember, he says, these are the, the, the message of the Spirit to the churches. Let him, let him that have ears hear what the Spirit is saying to the church is. Throughout the time, of, from John's time of writing all the way till the end, every church, he says, this is written for you. You need to take heed to this. You need to be aware and draw out the application that are here. Now, if you disagree with me, I love you nonetheless and hope that you can find uh, some profit from the application. So with that behind us, let us now get into the exposition. As you can see from your outline, if you, uh, there are some outside if you don't have one, um, the answer to John's uh, the question, that second question that I stated, is what will become of the saints during the time of tribulation. John gives us these three points. They will be protected, they will, be faithfully, uh, they will faithfully endure to the end, and they will be raised up in victory unto glory. Let's now read verses 1 and 2 of chapter 11, Revelation chapter 11. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out. For it is given over to the, to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Let's uh, ask the Lord's help. Father, we confess that we are babes and have very limited and weak understanding. Lord, I don't claim to know everything that's here. I just pray that I would be able to draw out in truth, Lord, what is for us today, your people living in the 21st century. Help us by your grace, Lord, to set aside whatever uh, differences we may have in terms of interpretation that we may still benefit, Lord, from your word today. I pray this, uh, and those who don't know you today would be the day they would come to faith in Jesus Christ. I pray this in his name. Amen. Now, at the time of John's writing, the book of Revelation, Herod's temple in Jerusalem was already destroyed. So what temple is John asked to measure here? And how do you measure the people that are in the temple, as it says he is to do? Well, I believe John is here using figurative language to describe the body of believers as being the temple of God, consistent with the teaching of the New Testament. I don't think I need to prove this to you, but I'll just mention a couple of references. Peter says we are living stones, and when we come together, we form a temple where God dwells, and that we are also the priests in that temple. So we're not only the stones that come together and form this building where God dwells, but we are also the priests in the building who are offer up, offering up spiritual sacrifices unto the Lord. Uh, John himself uses this analogy in Revelation 21. Revelation 21, is uh, he shows us there is this city coming down from heaven, the New Jerusalem. And he tells us that this New Jerusalem is the bride of Christ. And that it's, he tells us there is no temple in this New Jerusalem. Why? Because God is dwelling amongst his people. And so uh, we see then uh, that measuring this temple uh, and, and the worship uh, worshipers is just like numbering. Remember in, in chapter 7, uh, there was a roll call. It says 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000 from this tribe. And there's 144,000 that are mentioned from different tribes of Israel. And what is the purpose there? Because we see that same number, 144,000, in chapter 15, standing on Mount Zion with the Lord. What, what, this, what this is telling us is Every single believer will be counted for. Not one will be lost through the tribulation. Just like they were numbered and kept through, God says he's going to measure them 
and preserve them unto the end. Not one of them will be lost. That's, that's the goal, that's the teaching that, we, that he wants us to take away here. The Lord knows those who are his own, and not one of them will be lost. They will be counted and measured, and they will be preserved through all kinds of tribulation. John 6, 39, it says, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up unto the last day. John 10, 27, Jesus says, We are in the safekeeping of both he and the Father. No one can snatch us out of their hands. We may lose everything in life, including our lives, but our eternal souls are in the safekeeping of God himself. Neither Satan or any of his emissaries can touch us. Oh yes, they can kill the body, but death is just a temporary condition for the believers. Because God will raise us up at the end, as we will see in this chapter. So brethren, if you are frightened by the current events and the future of our country, fear not. You are safe in the safekeeping of the Lord of heaven. Now, before I move on, next point, let me just say a brief word about the illusion that John makes in Ezekiel 40. I don't want anybody to feel slighted here to think, oh, no, I'm just glossing over stuff and I'm not touching up. Trust me, what I, the, the study I've made is a lot more than this. If I give you everything, we'd be here for hours. So I'm just giving you a summary. You can ask me out uh, later. In Ezekiel 40, uh, Ezekiel is taken to Jerusalem in a vision in the 25th year of the exile and sees a man with a measuring rod who proceeds to measure the temple. Some believe that this will be the, built during the seven-year tribulation, and this is the temple that John is called to measure in a vision. But I believe if you look at Ezekiel chapter 47, it's a very, very interesting. Look at verse 12, 1 to 12, you can, at your own leisure, not now. What you'll see is this, at verse 12, and compare that with Revelation 22, 1 and 2. And what he's saying is saying, from the temple, in Ezekiel 47, and it's almost like word for word of uh, Revelation 22, 2, he says there's going to be a river that comes from the threshold of the temple. And this river is going to run down this city. And this river is going to have two trees on one on either side of it. And it's going to bear fruit for the healings of the nation. And there's going to be, uh, the leaves are for the healing of the nation. It's got, they're going to be, bear fruit throughout their season, word for word. So what I believe that what, what uh, this uh, Ezekiel's temple has is, is a foreshadowing of that eternal king, uh, kingdom of God, eternal city where dwells righteousness, where God dwells amongst his people and uh, and so uh, that's really the true fulfillment of Ezekiel's temple, if you, if you want to consider it, just for your consideration. Now, continue with me in verse 2, where John gives us a specific instruction as to what not to measure. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Now, Herod's temple, like Solomon's temple, had an inner and an outer court. We're told that the inner court was divided into three sections. One was for the men, the believe, uh, Jewish men. Uh, the other one was for the women. And the third one was for the priests. The outer court was uh, for the Gentiles, those who were of non-Jewish descent, but had come to worship Yahweh. You recall that Jesus drove out the money changers uh, from there and told them, told the, the, the Jews who were buying and selling uh, animals and exchanging money, he says to them, he says, you have made my house into, uh, you have become into a den of thieves. My house shall be called a house of prayer, Isaiah 56 tells us, for all nations, for all nations. Commentators are divided as to what to make of the outer court not being measured. Uh, some see the inner court to be the true believers, while the outer court are the professing believers who have compromised with the world. 
And uh, so at the time of persecution, they will just give up their pr profession and join with the world. Uh, I think Robert Mounce, I agree with him on this. He suggests that this is, uh, this is meant to convey the reality of both. God protection of believers on the one hand, while at the same time they will be facing severe persecution and martyrdom on the other hand. And it sounds like a paradox, right? How is God going to protect his people and yet they're going to be put to death? It sounds like, wait a minute, is this contradictory statement? No, it isn't. Because remember, death is not the end, right? And so even though believers will be put to death, as we will see in a moment, but yet what happens? They're raised to life. And they're ascended into the very presence of God. So that's not the finality. Uh, death is not that what, what should be of great concern to us. And this really flows with what Jesus promised the apostles. He says, remember, in uh, John 16, 33, he says, In the world, you will have what? Tribulation. But in me, you'll have peace. Because why? I've overcome the world. You can rest assured that whatever comes your way, you're safe because I overcame and you will overcome too. So we can rest in that. We see a beautiful picture of this. I love Psalm 46. One of the early sermons I preached, I wound up preaching three sermons on this psalm. My, my son thought that's all I'm going to be preaching on for the rest of the time. But it's a beautiful, beautiful psalm. And in that psalm, it's a very picturesque. He gives us he, this, this city of God. and he's, he, First of all, he tells us about this upheaval that's going on. The mountains are shaking. They're being cast into the midst of the sea. Everything is turning upside down. Now remember, mountains don't shake. If mountains shake, we're in trouble. Everything is like in upheaval. But here's what he says. In the midst of all this commotion and upheaval, there is a river whose stream made glad the city of God. The holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Beautiful, beautiful picture. You see all this craziness going around outside, and there's this city that's at peace. Why? Because God is in the midst of her. Whatever happens outside, there is peace within, because Jesus is with his people. Though the nations rage and all kinds of upheaval in the world, the city of God shall not be shaken because God is in the midst of her and he will supply her with what? Life-giving spirit, life-giving water flowing into this city so that it is kept by his grace. Many brethren, many have tried over the centuries to destroy the city of God, this, this church of Christ, and they could not. They could not because to this day, the gospel is still going forward till the ends of the earth. Try as they may, they cannot because Jesus is in the midst of his people. And he's promised to be with us till the end of time. Nations will come, nations will go, but his kingdom will remain forever. We're also told in verse 2 that the holy city will be trampled by the nations for 42 months. Now, again, this is, some of you, uh, futurist brethren, will disagree with me, so be it. Uh, I believe the holy city is another designation for the people of God as they will face se severe persecution in the final days. The Old Testament allusion to this is Daniel 8. Uh, chapter 8, verses 9 to 14, where the sanctuary is to be trampled underfoot for 2,300 days by the little horn, as he is called, which is a prophecy about Anti Antiochus of Epiphanes, uh, the, the Hellenistic Syrian king who desecrated the temple as he defeated the Maccabees somewhere around 167 and 164 B.C. Uh, let me say also a word about the, this time period, 42 months, sometimes referred to as 1260 days, and time, times, and a half time that are mentioned here and somewhere uh, and other places in the book of Revelation. 
These are references to uh, the time of suffering mentioned in Daniel uh, chapter 7, uh, 8, 9, and 12. Uh, and those who, uh, those who hold to the church being raptured before or midway through the tribulation believe this is speaking of Jewish suffering in the last three and a half uh, year period of the tribulation, also referred to as Jacob's troubles. You find that in Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Others who hold to a different view see it as a representative period of the suffering uh, the church has endured throughout the centuries from the time of Christ's resurrection until the time of his second coming. Whatever view you hold, uh, the application for this message, passage doesn't really change, as we will see in a moment in Luke 21. Believers have been sustained in the time of tribulation in the past, and they will continue to be sustained in future tribulation. So we have seen that God will protect his saints, that, uh, that not one of them will be lost. Now we will see what kind of trouble believers will be faced with at the end and how the Lord will enable them to endure to the end. Look with me at verses 3 to 6. Revelation 11, verses 3 to 6. And I will grant uh, authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. Uh, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the uh, power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying, and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. Who are these two witnesses? Uh, John uses a couple of different metaphors to describe the witnesses. One, the first one he uses is the two olive trees and two lampstands, which are an allusion to Zechariah 4, uh, where there are, there are, there is a lampstand that is flanked by two olive trees that supply it with oil, and which are a reference to Joshua the high priest and to Zerubbabel the governor. These are anointed and uh, they were to rebuild the temple. Um, the angel in, uh, interprets this to Zechariah in verse 6, and he says uh, that it's a message for Zerubbabel, who was to oversee the work of rebuilding the temple, and the message was this, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The temple was not going to be rebuilt by their resources, uh, but by the power of the Spirit of the Lord. The lesson for us here is this, brethren. One, as believers, we are to be light of Christ in this dark world of sin. The darker the world gets, the brighter the light will shine. Two, the power and authority for an, for an effective witness lies not in our ingenuity but in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is not our resources or clever methodology that will win the loss, but the Holy Spirit empowering us in the same way that he empowered the apostles so that they went into the ends of the earth to spread the gospel. A second allusion that John makes is in describing the witnesses is that of Elijah and Moses. It was common expectation that Elijah would be returning before the day of the Lord, as we read in Malachi 4, 5. Behold, I will send you, Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And a prophet like Moses, as we read in De Deuteronomy 18, 18. Some see these as two literal prophets who are raised up at the end with the same spirit and power of Moses and Elijah to preach repentance to Israel and to do miracles. But I believe in the same way that they appear to Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration as a representatives of the law and the prophets who are testifying to Christ. 
Here again we see them as faithful witnesses bearing testimony for Christ. And in accordance with the law of Moses, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be established. So I believe that these witnesses are representative of all the believers who will bear a faithful witness in the time of tribulation, both now and at the end times. We can see this in Revelation 12, verse 5 and 6, where the woman who, was, uh, who gave birth to the child is sustained in the wilderness for 1260 days, the same number of days that these two witnesses prophesied. We can also see this from the fact that it says in, in verse 7 that when they finished their testimony, the beast of the bottomless pit make, made war or battle. The word there is polymon in Greek, polymon, with them, and he will conquer them and kill them. Now, usually when we speak of war or a battle, we're not talking against two individuals, we're talking about an army or a multitude of people. The same we see in 12.17. You can turn there if you wish. 12.17 is, The dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war, polymon, the same word, on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Later in 13.7 we read that he conquers them. So he's making war against who? The seed of the woman. Not two individuals, the seed, the entirety of believers. And he's conquering them. What are, what are we going to read about the, the, two, the two witnesses in, in, in verse 7? Satan conquers them. Same thing, same word. And but So just to help you see that, you know, let Revelation explain Revelation, okay? There is a seed of the woman that's being conquered as bearing faithful witness unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan conquers them. Um, John also tells us that these two witnesses were clothed in sackcloth, which is a symbol of mourning and grieving. Their, passage was to, their message was to warn people of the imminent judgment and to call them to repentance before it is too late. Another detail John gives us is that they did it in 1260 days. Why does he do it in days versus months? Right? We read earlier 42 months, or another place we'll read three and a half years. So why is it? Well, the fact is they're going to be out there faithfully day in and day out for 1260 days or three and a half months. It's a day-to-day -day activity. A couple of lessons that we can draw from this. One, we are ambassadors for Christ every day of the week and not just on church evangelism days. You know, it's easy to say, uh, oh, I went to Saturday outreach. I went to the abortion clinic. Check. I did my evangelism duty today or this week or this month. No, brothers and sisters, just like these witnesses, they were out there 1,260 days, day in and day out, bearing witness. You are a witness for Christ wherever you go. It's a 24-7. You don't witness one day, and then you're no longer a, a witness for Jesus the next day. You are a witness. Secondly, warning people of judgment and calling them to repentance must be part of our gospel presentation, even when it is not what people want to hear. What is it today, brethren, is that people want affirming, positive messages, and many preachers will accommodate them because they want to enlarge their numbers in the pew or support their ministry. Give them what they want. Jesus loves you, and he wants to fix your life, fix your marriage, fix your financial situation, help you in those. What happened when that doesn't work? Well, I tried Jesus, and he just didn't work for me. No, brethren, they were preaching repentance. How do we know this? Because three and a half years later, they got killed. It says because the people finally said, we're done with you. You've been tormenting us all this time. Now we can sin freely without you telling us that we're sinning. So it's obvious, brethren, if you, if you give the people uh, the message they want to hear, this church would be full. Look, look, look at uh, Joel Olstein's church. Thousands flocked to him. 
on the, on the TV and everywhere. Because, you, you know, it's a positive, affirming message. Make people feel good about themselves. You're not so bad. Tell yourself you are, you are good. That's what he says. So, brethren, if we're going to preach the truth, we're going to face consequences. John the Baptist, wasn't min, wasn't, he wasn't mincing word when he ter- told Herod, Hey, Herod, what you're doing is wrong. You are not to take your, 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 your brother's wife uh, for you. That's wrong. And what happened? Head chopped off. You tell people what they want to hear, they love you. But as soon as you start preaching repentance, calling people to turn from their ways, turn to the Lord, and they're under judgment, and all of a sudden they're no longer your friend. The smiles turn into frowns. A third lesson we are not to get the third lesson is this. We are not to get discouraged because people's rejection of the word. They were faced with hostile crowd who eventually succeeded in killing them. So hostility doesn't mean that, okay, now, as we're going to see in a moment, I'll, I'll draw that out a little more. That means we, we've got to stop. Uh, I was reading just uh, Voice of Martyrs, just their last issue, Uh, There was recently a brother in Sri Lanka who got converted out of a life of drug and alcohol addiction. And he now had a burden to reach young people with the hope of the gospel to keep them from falling into that same life of addiction. He was ministering in a predominantly Hindu village. And many who were running the alcohol and drug business were very angry with him. He told his pastor one day, he said, that though he might, uh, he, he might be killed for his work, he would not stop fighting for the hearts of, of the young generation. One day, four men broke into his house, and they beat him mercilessly until he died. They took him to the hospital, but it was too late. He died. Ironically, one of those men who killed him had recently received a food parcel because it was his custom to go around town seeing who needs help and the poor people, and he would give them parcels of food to show them the love of Christ. One of those men who killed them was one of those men who received a parcel of food. Where did this kind of courage and love and faith come from? We learn about this in the, next, in the, in the passage. It is described in terms of the supernatural power that the two witnesses possessed. What is described here for us as fire and being able to turn things, uh, water into blood and all the plagues and so on. This, I believe, brethren, is the reference to the power of God's word and the Holy Spirit's empowerment to bear witness for the Lord. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 23, 29, he says, Is not my word like a fire, declares the Lord? And like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? In contrast to the words of the lying prophets who were prophesying lies in God's name in order to deceive the people, the faithful prophets, on the other hand, would speak his word, which is able to burn the chaff and reveal the wheat. Burn the false and reveal the true. Uh, Turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. This is a passage where the Lord Jesus is speaking about, is going to foretell of his second coming, the the things that are going to happen between now and then, between the time he was speaking and then. And I'm going to read verses 10 to 19. I think you'll see that it has application for us here. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, There will be great earthquakes in in various places, famines and pestilences, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it, therefore, in in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer. 
For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all men, uh, by, by, excuse me, you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish by your endurance. You will gain uh, your life. In this passage, Jesus is speaking of persecution against believers coming from every direction. Religious leaders, the synagogues, secular governments, kings and governors, family members, parents, siblings, and the society at large, hated by all men for my name's sake. So from every angle, from every direction, there is persecution coming on believers. And as you know, this happened to the apostles. They were brought before the Sanhedrin. They were brought to stand before governors. They were hated by their own countrymen. And so it continues even to this day. Uh, but they will certainly be wide scale and widespread at the end. How are we as believers to react when these things happen? How are we to, believe, to react? Well, one we're to see it as an opportunity to bear witness for Christ and not cower and keep silent. Look with me at verse 13. This will be an opportunity to bear witness. Did you notice? He didn't say, this will be an opportunity for you to go into hiding. This will be an opportunity for you to just gather together and just don't say nothing to anybody. Just hide. Preserve your lives. No, he says, this very time, Persecution from the government, persecution from family, persecution from society, persecution from the religious leaders. What are you to do? This is the time to bear opportunity for you to bear witness. Many brethren around the world, brethren, they said the greatest witness they had was in prison. Because prisoners came to the Lord in mass because they're hopeless. And so... That's not the time to cower. The greater the, op the opposition, the bolder our witness should be. People tell us today that it's not cool to talk about Jesus, while at the same time they don't shy away to speak about on behalf of Satan, their king who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. No, brethren, we serve a glorious king, and we have a glorious message of hope of salvation for the world. So if they're bold in their witness for their king, should we be cowardice and fearful in bearing witness for our king, our righteous Savior? Second, the second thing that we learn from this passage is we need to be anxious. We need not be anxious about how we are going to respond in the moment, but we know that God will give us the wisdom. He says, I'm going to give you wisdom in verse 14 and 15. He says, settle it therefore in your minds not to, not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand. How many times, I've heard this so many times, brethren will say, the word just came to me. I wasn't even thinking of it. And the Lord just put the words in my mouth right in the moment. And it came and I just, God just like spoke. God spoke, you know, I, I think, brothers, you hear the term, God showed up, right? And yeah, in the moment, where did that come from? Well, the Holy Spirit is going to empower us to say what we need to say. Thirdly, we're to know that God will preserve us even if we die for our witness. We will be raised up again into, unto eternal life. He says this in verse 18 and 19. He says, but not a hair of your head will perish. Now, Again, this is the paradox. Remember, a hair on your head, they're going to die. They're going to take, they're going to kill them. You know, whoever kills you is going to think he's doing God's service. So what does he mean? Well, verse, the following verse, by, by your endurance, you will gain your lives. You will have eternal life. Oh, they will kill the body, fine. But they can't take the soul. They can't take your inheritance. You are safe in Jesus. So, Death is exactly what happens to the two witnesses. Look with me at verse 7. 
And when they have finished their testimony, the, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. Once they finish their testimony, and only then the beast, this is not speaking of Satan himself, but those who are influenced by him will be allowed to kill the two witnesses. Note, brethren, you and I are invincible. We are invincible until our job is done. Lord will then call us home and not a moment sooner. He is sovereign over our life and death, so we need not fear what man can do to us. We are in the Lord's hands. Now, what will be the reaction of the world? Look with me at verses 8 to 10. When they, when they are put to death about these martyrs, and their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. Verse 10, And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents, because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. For three and a half days, they will have a party worldwide. Every tribe and kindred and tongue, they will see it, and they're going to rejoice. They're going to have a party, a celebration. They won. They won. They finally killed these menaces that have been troubling them all this time. Three and a half years. Now, finally, look at them. Look at them. And they're displaying them. They, they're gleeing. They're partying. Look, we got them. They're jeering. They're, they're just enjoying themselves. Finally, finally, darkness has overcome the light, has extinguished it. God is dead. No one, and now they can just sin with an abandonment because we're done with them. And that's the end of the story, right? Mm. No, not so fast. Look with me at verses, uh, verse 11 and 12. But, but... After the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet. And what happened now? Party's over. And great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. The breath of God entered in them, and they stood on their feet. This is a, an allusion to the Valley of Dry Bones, Ezekiel 37. Uh, and what does it sound like, brethren? That's right, the resurrection. The resurrection from the dead. Never again to die. Death has been swallowed up in victory. God is sovereign over life and death, and not Satan. The two witnesses are then called up to heaven to dwell in his presence forever to be honored and glorified. This, uh, by the way, brethren, is no secret rapture because it says they all are going to see them and fear will come upon all of them. Now, I believe, brethren, that those who hold to a pre, our brethren who hold to a pre-wrath or mid-trib rapture would use this passage to support their position because the next thing that happens after two witnesses ascend to heaven is the seventh uh, angel blows his trumpet, 1115, which ushers in the bowls of wrath in 155. But that's a discussion for another day. Now, what was the response of the world? In verse 11, we read, Great fear fell on those who saw them. They were terrified. Game is over. That party was very short-lived. God is certainly not dead as they thought, and now it's curtains for them and for their prince, Apollyon. It is judgment time. As the faithful witnesses were ascending to heaven, we read in verse 13, and at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to God of heaven. 
Just like there was a great earthquake prior to God's judgment in 612, after, after the, uh, the fifth seal, uh, here, again, we see a great earthquake prior to the pouring out of the bowls of wrath. Many were killed by this earthquake, and as, as for the rest, we were told that they were terrified and gave glory to God. Now, are we to understand that these people were converted? They gave glory to God? Is that what it's saying? Well, if you read further, in 16.9, here's what it says. They cursed the name of God who had poor power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. So those who survived... Here's their reaction later. So what does it mean that they glory to God? Well, it's very similar to what Nebuchadnezzar is. They acknowledge God's sovereignty over life and death and, death and his majesty. It's just simple acknowledgement. God, you are glorious. You know, like, like uh, when, 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 uh, when Elijah was on Mount Carmel and he, he put those, those, uh, the priests of Baal to shame, as God sent down fire, and everybody fell down on their face, and they said, Yahweh is God, Yahweh is God. Well, that's just an acknowledgement of the fact, because these other gods didn't answer. And God is the only one that answered. Did they repent? Only God knows. Now, let me just say a brief word about the city where they are put to death. It, it, it tells us it is symbolically referred to as Sodom and Egypt where our Lord was crucified. So it is a city, uh, when we say Sodom, just like I was saying earlier, immediately you know it's a city of immorality. And what did Egypt do to God's people? They oppressed them. They enslaved them. So it's a city of immorality and where God's people were being enslaved. Now, there's a clause here that has caused uh, some commentators to believe this is speaking of Jerusalem because it says, where their Lord was crucified. While others uh, believe that it's Rome because seven times, seven other times where the word great city is mentioned, it's Rome, which is sometimes referred to as Babylon. I can give you references later if you, if you like. So without going into much explanation for the sake of time, let me just give you my view. John here is using Rome as a representative of the world's political and religious system that will be in, position, in opposition to God and his people, as we will see in chapters 12 and 13. The main takeaway of this section, brethren, is this. The Lord will empower us to bear witness for him. Satan will stir up opposition against the believers. Martyrdom is to be expected but not before we finish our witness, and then the saints will be raised and glorified. That's what I believe this passage is telling us. John ends these two visions with a transitioning sentence in verse 14. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. So the two visions uh, and, and the second woe are ended. There is one final woe left. That will be at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, which happens uh, in, in verse 11, 15, but really doesn't take place. The, the pouring out of the wrath associated with that trumpet doesn't don't happen until chapter 16. Well, that's my understanding of this passage. I'm sure others can give you a lot different understanding, and that's fine too, but I just want us to walk away with some application. The opportunity, first of all, the opportunity to respond to the gospel is now. Some of you have heard the gospel many times before. You've heard about the need to repent of your sins and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've heard about Christ as Savior who came, who left heaven, took on flesh, lived the perfect life, died the sinner's death on the cross as a substitute for our sins. And you've been told time and time and time and time again to turn from your sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you that there's coming a day when that gospel witness will be silenced. In the same way that the two witnesses will be put to death, but then the day of mercy and grace are over. You cannot continue in your rebellion 
because there is a point in the day when that gospel witness won't be there. Your heart will be your heart will be hardened. I urge you to get right with God today before it is too late. Your morality won't save you. Your wealth won't save you. Your parents won't save you. Only Christ can. Turn to Him today and have eternal life. Be safe in Him. Be part of His chosen people. Secondly, as I mentioned earlier, for us believers, we can face the future with confidence because our protection is certain. I left out verses 10 and 11 in Psalm 46. Here's what it says. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. These are tremendous words of encouragement for us, brethren, as we face an uncertain future with questions like these. Will the U.S. be subject to more terrorist attacks because of our support of Israel? I don't know. But I know that God's got, got it under control, and He's our God, and He will be with us and bring us through it. Will the economy tank and the dollar drop in value because of the BRICS alliance? If you don't know what BRICS is, you can look it up. I don't know, but I know this, that God is in control and he's our God, and he will see us through. Amen. Will there be more persecution in the U.S.? Yes, yes, for sure. But the Lord of hosts is with us, and he will be our refuge. They will kill our body, but they can't kill our souls. When everything around us is shaking, cling to him. And find security and safety in him alone. Everything else will shake, brethren. Everything else will shake. Even the heavens will shake one day. But one thing cannot shake. God and His promises. Amen. Thirdly and finally, keeping an eternal perspective will also enable us to face persecution today. Paul did this as he faced many trials in his missionary journeys. He tells us in 2 Corinthians 4 how he was able to endure. Uh, and some of you have committed this to memory. Remember he says that... Uh, we don't lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, our inward man is being renewed day by day. Because he says, we look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen, because the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. And they cannot be compared to the weight of glory that awaits us. So he kept that. Paul wasn't, he was a human being. He was no superhuman. He didn't have some kind of a super superpowers he was not a stoic person who didn't feel pain go ahead kill me you know I, I can't feel a thing no he wasn't like that he was just like us but he had an eternal perspective so we don't lose heart and get discouraged on account of our troubles because what waits ahead of us and so we need to keep our eyes upon that prize, upon our Lord Jesus Christ, His promises for us, and that uh, may He help us to endure through whatever comes, whatever difficulty we may be faced with, that our Savior is there with us. And, brethren, as we, we are together as a, as, 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 uh, as a body and uh, able to uh, go through whatever difficulties, because the brethren are supporting and sustaining each other during that time. 